the symbolism of the colour pink and dawn. Pink symbolically describes love. Whether love is largely feminine in nature. It is intended to symbolise guileless, somewhat innocent love, the love that one has for children, for example, and the love a child may give. Love tempered by moderation, no great waves of gushing sentiment. Touched by love. Do you know what it is to be touched by love? It is the gentlest of touches. At first a flutter of emotions, then the songs of longing heard in your heart, sung on fresh early mornings and when the moon is full. Then, as love grows closer, its wings brush your heart and the down soft joy of it sends you into raptures. And then there is that feather soft kiss that sends you soaring into the clouds flying above earthly woes. No cares now, pink pleasures sewn upon a quill. But then you realise you have become a captive bird, a little caged thing, not free, bound by the invisible bars of love to sing out your song forever for the pleasure of another. Cochineal As the love becomes more passionate, the colour deepens and the more red symbolically, the greater the passion. Eventually, if the colour is more red than pink, the love is effectively lust and becomes a masculine symbol. Lying asleep quite late into the night. Lying asleep quite late into the night, I felt my love lean over in the bed. Dark, I felt the brush of that sweet head, perfumed and long her hair, with bare throat made to bite. Too dark for blushing, and too warm for white. But perfect coloured, and her mouth was red, and her lips opened amorously and said, I know not save one word, delight. Venus and Mars So this does not exclude the possibility that an actual woman may experience red heart lust and an actual man's sincere romantic pink love. However, if a man gives a woman 21 red roses, symbolically, what he is expressing is a red-hot lust. But this is general run-of-the-mill symbolism and can be found explained in all sorts of books and magazines. Within mystic symbolism, pink has a very, very unique meaning, which owes something to the general symbolism, but conveys a great deal more. First, however, let us ease gently towards this understanding by looking at the Greek gods. Dawn and the Gods In Greek mythology, the personification of the evening star is called Hesperus, or Hesperos. The Roman equivalent was called Vespa. The personification of the morning star is called Eosphorus, in Greek, bearer of dawn, or phosphorus, bearer of light, translated as Lucifer in Latin. Physically, they represent the same actual planet, Venus. Venus's orbit lies between that of the Earth and the Sun. Depending on the orbital locations of both Venus and Earth, it can be seen in the eastern morning sky for an hour or so before the sun rises and dims it. 
or as the evening star in the western evening sky for an hour or so after the sun sets, when Venus itself then sets. Venus is the brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon, outshining the planets Jupiter and Saturn. But while these rise high in the sky, Venus never does. This may lie behind the myths about deities being cast down. Eosphorus and Hesperus were brothers, and both were the sons of the god Eos, and the Roman equivalent is Aurora, who was the goddess of dawn. In the following poem we see the two sorts of symbolism combined, ordinary mortal love and divine love, Aurora and Cephali. Here I am, Aurora, goddess of the dawn. Below, beloved Cephali stifles his first yawn. We've spent daybreak together, making love amongst the stars, soaring on the rings of Saturn, lying scorched on red Earth's Mars, sliding down through Venus morning star, watching blue clouds pass. And we're resting here on Jupiter, in great swirls of red spot gas. The one I love, the one I love, he's had love he's never known. I've seduced him, I have loved him, celestial pleasures I have shown. He has reached new heights of ecstasy, he's died of heavenly bliss. I have shown him seventh heaven and he repays me with a kiss. And each dawn he goes and leaves me as I fade back to sun. Into the dazzling rays of loneliness, I wait for night to come. And my tears at every going send out storm clouds across the sky. Black and full of pain, they race away with heaving west winds sigh. And each day that he with breath suspends and never spends with me, brings tears of rain that flood his heart with my long mournful plea. Give up your cunning, scheming wife. Please, Cephali, please stay. And you can be a god like me, perhaps the god of day. But Aurora is not mortal. Her love-struck face cannot be seen. Cephali only knows during daytime that his dreams have rapture been. He knows only that he aches for sleep and aches for early dawn and the feeling every morning that he is a man reborn. And he only knows the tedious day drags on in the harsh light, and that his wife's soft body has no appeal for him at night. He only knows that pink soft light of sunrise and new day is the only time he's happy, and that such thoughts won't go away. Dawn and the spiritual path. In mystic symbolism, dawn marks the culmination of the spiritual path. Shankara At dawn I call to mind the essence of the self, shining forth, self-effulgent in my heart, the fourth Turaya, which is existence eternal, pure spiritual consciousness and bliss, the goal and salvation of the highest swans, Parahamsas. If we look at the diagram of the stages of the spiritual path, one has weathered the storms of autumn, been through the gruelling purification of winter, and reached symbolic dawn or east. In doing so, one may experience the states of moksha or nirvana, as such, you have symbolically found the Holy Grail. Seraphita by Honoré de Balzac Translated by Catherine Prescott Wormley When you have once felt the delights of the divine, intoxication which comes of this internal travail, then all is yours. Once take the lute within your hands, you will never part with it. Hence the solitude in which angelic spirits live, hence their disdain of human joys. 
they have withdrawn from those who must die to live. They hear the language of such beings, but they no longer understand their ideas. They wonder at their movements, at what the world terms policies, material laws, societies. For them all mysteries are over. Truth and truth alone is theirs. Those who reach this stage are destined to leave the wheel of life and the mundane completely. Thus, no reincarnation on earth. Seraphita by Honoré de Balzac Translated by Catherine Prescott Wormley They have reached the point where their eyes discern the sacred portals, do not look back, do not utter one regret, but comprehend their destinies, keep silence, wait, and bear their final struggles. The worst of all those struggles is the last. At the zenith of all virtue is resignation, to be an exile and not lament. No longer to delight in earthly things and yet to smile, to belong to heaven and yet to stay on earth. Often celestial visions of descending angels can pursue about with songs of praise, then tearless, uncomplaining, must you watch them as they reascend the skies. To murmur is to forfeit all. Resignation is a fruit that ripens at the gates of heaven, more eloquent by silence than the prophet by speech. Such beings triumph by their simple presence. Conclusion Seraphita by Honoré de Balzac Translated by Catherine Prescott Wormley Spirits of the poor, ye sacred flock, come forth from the hidden places, come on the surface of the luminous waves. The hour now is, come, assemble. Let us sing at the gates of the sanctuary. Our song shall drive away the final clouds with one accord. Let us hail the dawn of the eternal day. <laughs>